I think as design teams, more than anybody else, we really understand that we are not always the people we're making things for. In fact, we almost rarely are the people we're making things for. And that's why it's so important to have a diverse design team, to really understand the people that you are creating experiences for. You need a team that has been there, has lived it in some way, shape, or form. Um, and the only way you're going to get that is by adding a bunch of folks to your team from different types of backgrounds. So there are four ways that I like to think about diversity. These are not the only four ways. These are not the best four ways. These are just the way that I like to bucket and think about things. The first category is identity and belonging. And I think this is the category we hear people speak about the most. It includes the demographic characteristics that people identify with, whether that's ethnicity, gender, sexuality, religion, age, et cetera. The second bucket that I think about is experience and background. And so this captures the life experiences and context in which people have lived. This might be things like income, socioeconomic status, education, family structure, the things that have kind of shaped somebody's life. The third bucket, skill sets and knowledge, includes the subject matter and disciplines that folks might have expertise in. So when you think about a design team, these things might be uh, visual design or interaction design or prototyping or motion or content. They might be more broad, like journalism. Um, there's a bunch that can go in here. And then lastly, I think about abilities and working styles, and that captures the physical and mental, mental excuse me, capabilities that people might have. So I think a lot about neurodivergence in here. I think about different kinds of impairments. Um, I think about the different ways that people learn. Do you learn visually through words or through pictures, or do you like to learn by doing? So as I think about building a design team, it's really important to get pieces of all of those things, especially at Chime where we're designing banking experiences for the average American. Our average Americans are really interesting, diverse people and all of those things are really important. So as I look to hire for my team, I'm not looking for one specific profile, maybe not even looking for somebody who went to the best school or is coming from a certain company. What I'm doing is I'm kind of looking at all those things I just mentioned and trying to figure out what's missing and then really specifically hire for those things. <clears throat> Love that, Sam. That's that's incredible. The, the fact that you, I know you're like a champion of you know, equity in the workplace. Um, and you've done that for a very long time, but it's so interesting to hear a leader say that they're not necessarily looking for sort of, I don't know how to bucket this, but like pedigree, um, which, you know, at least in startup land is quite the opposite. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting, right? I think Certain schools have really great programs. I've hired fantastic people out of those programs. I've also hired really fantastic people who are self-taught, who are super passionate about it, you know? And I think that good schools are great. And by definition, good schools, the people who go to good schools tend to come from certain backgrounds, tend to, how do I say this in the right way? Um, you're just not gonna find, I think, typically a diverse set of people at, if you're hiring out of one singular program, you know, or the same set of programs. Typically mm -hmm. folks who have had the privilege of maybe having internships early or doing these types of work look to be better candidates than folks who have not had those privileges. And that doesn't mean that they're necessarily better or worse designers. And so I really wanna be intentional about bringing folks in from any kind of background and giving everybody a chance to really show what they're made of and to let their work speak more than their background, you know, or more than the, the degree that they have. Um, so I typically try to use something kind of like this, you know, a little spider diagram and look at what pieces do I have strength in? What pieces am I missing? Um, and then really craft specific profiles with my recruiting team for those things so that we can really fill out the team. Of course, it's not just about hiring a diverse team. It's great to bring in a bunch of different types of people, but if you don't have a working environment that's equitable for all of those people and lets them all do their best work, you're not gonna have folks who stay and wanna be on your team. If you have, let's say, a team of extroverts and you're like, hey, we need more introverts, you hire an introvert and all the extroverts are just like, blah, 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 all the time, that person's like, whoa, you know, this is not the team for me. And so each time you add somebody different to the team, you really have to intentionally recraft your team's culture and think about what are our habits, what are our rituals, and how do we make these rituals that everybody's going to be able to be successful with. 
So that's my sneak peek. Read the chapter. Would love to chat with you more. Shahar, I'll pass over to you. Thank you, Samantha. And hello, everyone. Shahar here. Um, and for the people who are viewing this, you're probably part of an in-house design team or you're leading one. And the thing that is probably on your mind is how do I make sure that everybody's set up for success? I would say the first thing is thinking about your structure, how you're organizing your teams is really important to make sure that everybody is um, taking on the right tasks. They have the right resources around them mm. and Real talk here, there are millions of ways to slice and dice how you divide, how you structure your creative team. We were actually gonna talk about it later in the Q&A section, but uh, the way we tackled it at Pixar, for example, is thinking about these different verticals. We had product design that sat under product. We had content creating all the resources for our creators. And then we had the brand and creative sitting under marketing, creating all the marketing assets, whether it's billboards, emails, banners, anything like that. And that really helped us specialize and also work across the board, across the company in a more unified way. So um, another thing that has been on my mind as a leader, as someone who is, has been leading a creative team is making sure that they can thrive there. As creative people, we want to always introduce new thoughts. We want to be creative. That's the definition of our role. But as you know, if you're part of an in-house team, there are a lot of results. There are a lot of metrics, a lot of um, KPIs that you need to hit. So how do you encourage in the team that fresh thinking? My answer to that is actually embrace the process. A lot of these startups, a lot of these in-house teams, if you go to the next slide, um, a lot of these teams really lean heavily on the test and learn approach, especially on these digital executions where you're going to try a bunch of different things to see what performs best on digital. A lot of times that actually gives us opportunity to try things that we would normally not try on TV. You know, like if you think about your typical TV commercial, you're going to spend six months on it, hundreds of thousands of dollars. You can't have room for error. But in digital, it's all wide open. And if you're wanting something beyond just incremental improvements, it's worth trying something completely new. And that opens it up for it. The stakes are pretty low. So um, what I try to communicate to my team is that idea that we can embrace mistakes because it's a low touch medium, because we are embracing the test and learn, that is actually an invitation for us as creative people to make those quote unquote mistakes. It's not mistakes, it's us trying new things, seeing what sticks, what performs. Time and time again, I've seen that the execution that we least expected to perform best mm. actually was the one on the top. And that's partly because we were given permission to play. So I think that's really important in the process. Another aspect of how we communicate as designers or creative teams with the rest of the organization is finding that um, common language. When we're in meetings, there are special parameters or things we can do to facilitate great work for our designers. So first of all, I think it's really important to communicate to the rest of the org, if you're sitting under marketing or product or anything, that our job begins when the meeting ends. That means that our time should be spent mostly designing stuff. Sure, we can be part of meetings, we can discuss metrics and data points, but at the end of the day, someone needs to put on headphones, sit in front of the computer and design something. So our job begins when the meeting ends. And then on top of that, I've seen a lot of teams share the marketing brief with the creative team. And that's great. They need to be knowledgeable about the business challenges that we're trying to solve and where we wanna take the work. But it's not necessarily the most effective way to communicate with designers, creatives, maybe a distilled version, a creative brief could help translate that business need into something that is more of a common language to your designers. All right, I'll stop here and I'll pass it off to Adam. Thank you, thank you. All right, well, I'm gonna be talking more about just some different creative leadership models. Um, this first view here is just of my team. And I know as Sakara said that, you know, there are a million ways to slice and dice how you reorg or org your, your team. And that is 100% true. I've, over my, 26 years, both in agency for a couple of decades and also at Adobe for eight years. We've 
I, I, we've had rounds and rounds of reorgs, I swear, every year, it seems like. But uh, anyhow, the important thing here is as, as you're organizing your team, if we move along to the next slide, that the thing that I really want to keep in mind that's really, really important is um, that you make sure that everyone has two things, and that's accountability and ownership. You know, so as you're slicing things up, you want to make sure that it's not like the thing that's the worst for me is a big, huge pool of creatives where it's just like, all right, we're just going to have them in this big pool. And then every once in a while, we'll just give them random assignments. And it's just really hard for them to have, it's easy maybe for you to just send it all over the wall to them, but they really need to have a place where they can build relationships, where they can own something, where they can really shine and show that they really understand it and, and can dig in. So however you slice it, because the reality is it's going to change. Like the organization you have today is not necessarily the organization you'll need tomorrow. So figure out the organization that works right now and make sure everyone has accountability and ownership. Moving along from that, there's some other trends I just wanted to point out, and I won't spend a ton of time on it. But this first one is um, there's really a, a new trend in how you organize uh, your whole department. So traditionally, over the many years, the way I've seen um, marketing departments uh, be organized is you had your marketing director and underneath them, they had everything from strategy and brand and voice, and they you know, had all the relationships with agencies, then you had this creative team. And I think it really built this um, creative cave where you know, creative people, it was like, at least in the 90s, it was death march to go into an in-house you know, company because you were just kind of in that back cave. Things have changed, things are moving and, and, and transforming. And if we move to the next slide, you'll see, this is the new trend of how I see um, businesses organizing, it, where you have the marketing team separate from the creative team and you have a leader for the marketing and a leader for the creative and this is super important because you know i even went back and got a master's degree in integrated marketing strategy just to see what they were learning and, and what they're taught and they're not they don't learn even at the best schools how to be creative i mean that's as creatives we're training our brains our whole careers of how to have empathy and understand people and build emotional experiences and so in this new model it's really really important because it allows the creative team to own those agency relationships, use them as extensions of their team, own voice and style and own creative strategy separate from the, the marketing team. And then the marketing director and the creative director can come together as peers and work on projects together with their different points of view, almost like the different you know <clears throat> backgrounds and ways we look at things that, we, that uh, Sam talked about. Like this is another way of doing that is through just the way you organize your team. So not all businesses are organized this way, I get it. Um, so this is like, if you're a creative leader, you run a team, this is a good model for you to try and push for so that you can have a little more autonomy and ability to impact creative and impact experiences. That said, it's not easy. I totally get it. And it, it may be a journey, but, um, it's something worthwhile of pushing toward. <clears throat> and the last thing I want to point out here, and we won't go into too much detail on this. And this is just like the leadership, creative leadership maturity model. And I know it's an eye chart and there's a lot of information here, but you can look it up in the guide and read a little bit more about it. And beyond that, uh, SuperSide has been doing some round tables or maybe you know we've got different uh, moments where we've had chances to go through this in depth with groups and maybe you can talk to them and, and, and see about uh, a separate session. But this really important is I've seen over the years of how different people have been more mature with their creative leadership. If you're down on the lower end, it's really more about just the team and, and building some cool creative. And it's all, you know, very focused on, on the, the work, which is great. I mean, that's like the baseline. But as you mature in your creative leadership, it's really more outward facing where you're trying to impact, you know, different leaders around the company. How do you get more creativity in all things in your business? How do you get the, you know, finance and IT and others to believe in creative ideas? And how do you sell work? And how do you create an environment that makes it so that all the people who are creative are going to have a better opportunity of creating something. And so it takes effort and a different mindset. And it's not only good for you as a leader, but it's great for your team as you're, you know, organizing and looking for how are the different leaders on my team, you know, maturing and what level are they at? If they come in and they're just talking about their portfolio or their work only, then that's a good sign of where they're at on the scale versus a leader who will come into you and say, hey, I've been talking with some other peers and we've got this big idea of how to push X, Y, Z forward. Like there's, there's certain, you know, clues that you can, see of how people are maturing in their creative leadership and therefore you know you can better work on their careers or where they're at or where they can start working on so anyhow it's a good model um not only for yourself and for your team but also for your businesses check it out a little bit later but that's about it and now i am going to pass it on to our next guest 
moving it over to uh, Ching. Ching. Oh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. Um, hi, everyone. Again, yeah, my name is Ching, and I work at a company, a health tech company called Included Health. What we do is integrate virtual care services, such as preventive care, urgent care, with mental health services, along with a healthcare navigator. So that's sort of like a healthcare advisor um, who can navigate through the complex, what, what is the complex um, reality of healthcare in, in the US and uh, help you connect to the right in-person care um, doctor and specialist. So I started at Included Health in the midst of the pandemic. Um, it was around this time in 2020. So virtual healthcare services was skyrocketing at that time. And we had to scale our design team um, massively <laughs> during this hyper growth stage. Um, so when I joined the team, uh, when I say team, it, it was really one product designer, which is wild to more than a handful of product managers um, managing a diverse portfolio of different services. So what this, this poor soul <laughs> was um, juggling was was the end-to-end -end UX design, some marketing design, um, in-house uh, branding, even copywriting, what have you. So we were in desperate need of scaling that team. And this is what I'm going to be talking about, how to um, this, this model, this kind of framework checkbox for scaling a design team from one to five plus. So what you see here on this slide, um, you're always going to start with a first uh, generalist designer who can wear many hats um, kind of be that be that uh, source for these incoming requests. But as you're scaling, you do want to round out and build what you um, we can what you can think of as kind of a Swiss army knife. So it's laid out here in a linear way, but you want to think about it as a constellation of skill sets and specialties. At this small stage, um, everyone's going to be sort of a generalist. So you're not going to have somebody who can only do interaction or motion design who doesn't have a um, an eye for visual design, but you want to look for fortes uh, to, to, to really make an impact and, and get ahead of, of engineering and uh, impact the product experience. So a visual design specialist to uphold that design standard and make sure things are ready for production. Um, the third one here is a research specialist. So this is where you might get some pushback. I've seen it a lot. Um, we don't need a research specialist at this time. Designers can do their own research or we don't even have time for, for iterations and A-B testing and experimentation. But it is never too early to hire a research specialist. And I, I will repeat that um, over and over. And this, this proved really fruitful for us. This person is gonna be um, helping you with, with recruiting participants and uh, really running those tests and analyzing them, especially at that early stage when you are, when you are iterating and trying to find product market fit. Another one that you want to make sure you want to round out your team with is a strong interaction designer, someone who can spin out those prototypes pretty quickly in order to do those experiments and um, and iterations. And then the fifth hire, depending on um, who you've recruited so far. Um, you'll want to look at what the gaps are. For us, it was somebody with a domain expertise in healthcare, a couple healthcare um, companies under her belt to bring, bring that um, experience to the team. So once you have that team established, um, it's really important to keep them happy and not burnt out. So the company is going to be excited <laughs> that there's all of a sudden uh, design bandwidth and they're going to start pulling your team members into multiple projects. And how do you keep them from, from become, be not becoming overwhelmed? Um, so um, here I'm, I'm I'm adamant about protecting the team's 
time. So take a good look at the weekly meetings that you have, the hour long meetings, and see if you can shorten them to 45 minutes, 30 minutes. We're, we're all creatives here. So you know this. Um, time is, is the greatest asset, the greatest gift that you can give back to your team. So are there any weekly ceremonies that you can cut to biweekly? You know, nobody needs to sit in front of a, a computer for eight hours a day without getting a break without getting some fresh air. What energizes one team member might frazzle another. Um, I learned recently that a team member really dislikes escape rooms. You know, <laughs> we thought that was a fun thing that we were doing for team bonding and um, that just wasn't their way of, of um, de-stressing. So give the time back. Let people decide what to do with that time and how to unwind and unstress so that they can come back to the workplace or the next day fresh um, to, to keep those creative juices going. That is not to say that um, you should strip away all your meetings. You know, we're, we're in a collaborative environment. You need to talk to each other. So the one meeting to keep really sacred is your one-on-one -on -one with, your, with your team members. Um, keep this consistent. Keep showing up for them. There's too much instability in the world, in the workplace um, to be inconsistent. So be that stable foundation that your team, that your direct reports can come back to and keep empowering them. Um, so I, um, and make sure you, you follow your, um, your own advice. So I learned this the hard way. I was telling my team members constantly if they were having a rough day or having a rough time to hit the easy button, um, work comes secondary and make sure you take care of yourself. Um, at the same time, I found myself going through those back-to-back -back meetings, kind of numbing out and, and not checking in on my own uh, mental health and emotions. So it came to a point where I went to my manager and told him that I wanted to drop the people management aspect of my role and focus more on and shift over to an individual contributor role again, um, but maintain those strategic design uh, projects and continue working and collaborating with the team that I helped build. And no regrets so far. I am a happier, um, <laughs> kind of lighter being because of it. And I'm really grateful that the, um, the company was able to support me in that way. And because I don't have that director, uh, leadership, or um, people management title and responsibility, I, I found it... Um, it was it was such a such a nice surprise that um, I am able to still show up and and lead the team through through mentorship and through example. Nice. That's so inspiring. That's uh, that's really inspiring. Yeah. To anybody that's a individual contributor with, uh, who's aspiring to become whatever manager, director, what have you. This, this is great advice. I mean, I've, I've been in the same boat many times myself and. It's always this like toss up of like focus. Should I focus on the work or should I focus on enabling other people to do amazing work? Um, and sometimes it comes at the expense of like you not doing the things that you love and where you can have the most impact. Um, cool. No, that was super amazing. Um, I, Adam, I, I want to just pick on something that you said earlier. You, you, you talked about accountability and ownership. And of course, they both go hand in hand, which I really appreciate in the embedded model where the creative team is part of the marketing team might be its own sort of horizontal vertical function right whatever uh, in that scenario what is the role what where where, where where is the ownership lie um i ask this because people that i know and myself we sometimes struggle with this is does the ownership of the strategy and the ultimate results live with the marketer, you know, whoever the program owner is, um, mm -hmm. and what role does the creative lead who's quarterback in that marketer, what, what role do they play in that? And sometimes it's multifaceted, right? It could be like many different designers and creatives interacting with marketing. Yeah. Maybe let me explain a little bit more about what I meant by the ownership. So like I said, there's a lot of ways to slice it, but what I'm looking for in terms of ownership, isn't saying, 
owning all the programs, all the KPIs, all the things like those are different um, skills and, and responsibilities of like a marketer versus a creative. What I mean by ownership is, okay, let's say there's a creative team or a group rather than have them just work on anything. I'll say, okay, you, for example, at Adobe, there's like dozens and dozens of different products. There are different groups. There's different things. What I want to do is have it. So a team is embedded with maybe they support two different industries or they support one product or they support whatever. I want them to be able to go deep and really understand that product or that industry and really build relationships with all the, the stakeholders and marketers and you know all the other players who are part of that so that they feel like they have relationships. They feel like they have an understanding of the, the product so that they feel like they own that division and they own the work that is created for that. And so that's that's where there's the ownership and then the accountability, the same thing is like, because they're in charge of that industry or product or whatever it is, then they, they're basically the, you know, the, the final say, the end, the end person of who we go out uh, and ask questions about when it comes to do with, when it has to do with work on that project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Own your work and run with it. I think that's a line that you've said before. Um, I really, yeah, I really love that. I, it, ownership is just like such a funny thing. And I think a lot of people who are empowered and are high agency people, they interpret it, myself included, I would say, interpret it as like, I'm the CEO of this thing. And now I'm going to run and make all these decisions and try, or at least facilitate these decisions. Um, so it's nice to hear about that nuance. I appreciate that. Um, I also thought it was interesting that you put brand strategy under marketing. There's a, Diana, if you could go back to Adam's slide, um, the one where he shows how teams could be organized. Um, I really like that distinction where you've, you've, you've shown the distinction between brand strategy and, and creative strategy. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about that? Sure. And this may just be my bias just because I do a lot of that. But um, there, when you really... If you look at today, today we're in the experience era, right? Like the way that businesses are going to compete and, and differentiate is by creating amazing customer experiences that are very unique and, and that have value and they're connected. And a lot of times, you know, certainly with brand, both marketers or creatives could focus on that. They could say, oh, you know, it's like, what do we stand for? What are we doing? And I think to a certain extent, there's probably a collaboration at the highest level of what the brand is, and what it stands for. But there's a lot of like just little in the weeds strategy stuff that really happens of like, how are we naming different products? How are we naming events? How are we dealing with, um, you know, yeah, if we're at an event, how, how, where does the brand and how does it show up? And I think there are a lot more correlations between experiences than being on the marketing side where you're more thinking of like, okay, who's the audience? What's the KPI? How's, what's the best strategy to get after that person? On, on sometimes I see on the creatives, like they have a better understanding of those experiences and how the customer would want to connect with that. And therefore having s more strategic thought and having them focus on that in a different way. I th you could probably say brand strategy on both sides, but I, there's a unique side that's more of creative strategy or more of like the expression of the brand. If you really break it between the two, it's like the creative side is really the brand expression. Whereas the marketing side may be of like, what are we going after and more of like the brand purpose, I guess, or, you know, direction. So that's why I had it over there just so that it's not just limited to branding is not only done on marketing. It also includes creative. Cool. Nice. Um, yeah. Shahar, Sam, anything to add on that by any chance? And if not, that's okay. Cause it's some harebrained idea that Adam's putting out there that may be wrong, <laughs> maybe right. I have no idea. <laughs> You're the tone setter, Adam. Come on. <laughs> um, cool. Well, let's jump to audience questions. We, we we're getting some live questions right now, um, and then some of you sent us an email in advance of this panel, which is great. Uh, you can always spot the keeners uh, when they email you, like, "Hey, I have this question." So it's like, great. Um, so I'll start with one. Um, how do you navigate change as a creative leader? And this is such a great question because I feel like I, in particular, have done such a bad job kind of pulling in creatives into like, you know, like I, you can see kind of like the snowball effect and you can see it coming. And an, your job as a leader is to kind of sound the alarm or to say like, hey, heads up, some things might be changing. And I just I've just done such a poor job 
uh, particularly with the creative team o- over and over. Um, but change in general is hard. And you also don't want to sound the alarm too early because then people are like, wait, I'm going to stop and I'll, I'll stop doing this thing that's working. And now I'm going to p- focus my attention on something else. So talk, it, it, anyone can chime in, but talk a little bit about that, you know, particularly with the climate that we're in right now, where like orgs are pivoting every day, open up LinkedIn and like layoffs are happening. And so, you know, you've got to make change to adapt to like your, your circumstance and the market forces. Um, how do you think about that? I can jump in on this one um, just because it's been such a great area of learning for me in the last couple of years. Um, So I'm like aggressively type A and I really like to have plans and then I like things to go according to my plan. Um, And when they don't, I tend to be a really great person. Um, (laughs) So I have, you know, as a leader, as a leader during COVID, as a leader of a company that went from like 120 when I started to something like 1500 now, like lots and lots of change. Um, And the thing I've really coached myself on in the last couple of years has been just like taking every single thing one day at a time. And so kind of like making the plan that things will change, like that is the expectation is that something will be different. And so each morning you kind of like wake up. And you look at the day and you say, all right, like what is needed from me today based on the way the world is, based on the way the company is, based on the way my team is feeling, based on the way that I'm feeling like, what are the three things I need to get done today? You know, and and to Ching's earlier point, sometimes it's a like today I'm going to go for a long walk and I'm going to push the work a couple hours because like for me to show up as my best self right now, I need to go for a long walk and like that's okay. You know, and some days I wake up super energized. It's like, great, today we're going to get through 10 things on the to-do list because we got all the energy, let's get it done. You know, and some days it's like, there's something really crazy happening in the world and we're going to listen and make space for people, you know? And so it really is just like getting comfortable with each day assessing the highest impact things you can do and doing them. Samantha, you bring up a really good point. While we can't predict the exact change that might happen to your team, we know as leaders that change is constant. There's always going to be something new coming our way. And what I talk to teams a lot about is learning to surf the wave, wave. Uh, meaning not being surprised or when some change comes your way, knowing that that's the nature of our business and kind of coming, actually anticipating it and knowing how to adjust. So I think as a leader, there are two things you can do to help your team um, navigate change. I think, first of all, it's giving them clarity. There is so much noise around them. The one thing that you can do is give them the direction they need to do their job successfully. You can be that filter as a leader for the rest of your team. For, on a personal level, what I found um, really useful, and this is a tip I got from Jason. He was a ECD at White and Kennedy for a long time. And I asked him, how do you navigate change as, on a personal level? And he told me, as long as I'm clear on my own mission and my own values as a leader, I can navigate the change because things will change around me. But if I know how I evaluate work, if I know what good work looks like to me, I can be consistent about that and that will never change. So those are two kind of useful tips for for myself and for others. Yeah, I'll double down on something that Shahar, you just said about giving clarity to your team. And Amrita, you mentioned, you know, when, when do you give your team that heads up that something is about to change? I would say that the heads up is almost always, always going to be appreciated. But at the same time, be clear about whether this changes their current sprint or week's priorities or it doesn't, that I'm just giving you a heads up that this is going to be one month down the line. Um, So don't worry about it right now, but uh, I'm giving it to you for visibility. Uh, Secondly, I would say to, to everybody's point about change is the constant adaptability is such a key skill set that you want to look for during the hiring process. So beyond pedigree, beyond, you know, technical skills, have they been able to navigate change within their career? Because that's going to happen <laughs> at, at the company that you're hiring at and the company that you're joining. I don't know if you want to hear from all of us. I could add just a couple more things because I totally agree with, with what you have all said. I had a, an agency owner once tell me a phrase. He said, you're either progressing in your career or you're going down. There is no coast. You can't just coast along and stay the same. 
Mm-hmm. And I know <clears throat> I was in a, a leadership meeting recently and someone said that, isn't this such a tired answer, Adam? Aren't we like so much further along that we've got work-life balance? But the reality is there's still a creative hustle. You are the only one that controls your career. No one else controls it. And I learned that lesson early on that it's like, if I want to get ahead of change, then like Sakar had said, you got to have a plan and you got to be following your plan and you got to get ahead of it. And I think Sam hit on this too. Like you, you, when you were talking about how you're type A and you like to plan it all out, I can tell that you're a good creative leader because you've, you've got a plan. Like you're, you're aggressively going out there and, and progressing rather than just letting things affect you. So the way to deal with change is to just, is to change it. Like you be the change agent. You be the one who's driving for something or moving for something. So you're constantly progressing with that creative hustle. And it's a real thing. Like it's, I know it's exhausting, but it's a real thing if you want to, if you want to keep going. Yeah. Excellent advice. Um, if, if there comes a time where a creative org needs to be restructured, um, what, and, and I think again, people are with this climate, I think companies are going through that, not just for the creative team, but many other teams. What is a good way to think about that? What are the things to consider? Um, and, and what are the learnings that can be applied before you go ahead and do that? And not just, when I say restructuring, I don't mean just for the purpose of quote unquote downsizing, right? Like that's not what I mean. Sometimes you just need to restructure for other efficiencies, you know, to use your Adobe example, you have, you know, tens of hundreds of products and like maybe, you know, every, maybe every year you launch three or four new things and you might need to restructure because just entirely because of that. Um, So yeah, just looking for sort of like a consideration set. I can, oh, go ahead, Adam. I speak too much. Go ahead, Sam. (laughs) I was feeling a little bit the same way. Um, I can just say, I think with any restructuring or reorganization, the question is, what are you optimizing for? And I think restructuring or reorganization is one of those changes that is constant. Because to Adam's point, a company is always changing you know, you're progressing or you're regressing, but there's no such thing as coasting and staying the same. And so the people you have, the things you're trying to accomplish, they're going to be different every so often. And that means sometimes you're not organized the right way anymore. And so you need to shift around to be organized in a way that helps you be successful for whatever your goal is right now. And so the question is, what are you optimizing for right now? Are you optimizing for certain teams being more collaborative, in which case those folks go closer together? Are you optimizing for cohesion across certain experiences in which you know those teams go closer together? Are you optimizing for giving more people management experience? And so let's break into smaller teams so that we can elevate some folks to managers. Or do we have a bunch of managers who don't really wanna manage anymore? And can we make some larger teams with fewer managers? Like there are all kinds of things. Um, And so I think it's really important to remember that there is no one structure that works. There is no one structure that wins. It's really what do you, what does your team, what does the company need at this point in time? And how do you organize for that? Try things, maybe break a couple things, maybe try again. And then it'll probably change in a few months, years, whatever the time period is going to be. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. It's like the test and learn approach that I was talking about earlier, right? You applied to like organizing your team. Yeah. the I, I love that personally. And I'm also very comfortable with change, but I think it can be disorienting for people to like change it up too often. Like even like every six months could be very often for some people. Uh, but yeah, that's a, that's a good hack and shortcut for sure. Uh, we have like a lot of questions. Maybe I'll just start asking a couple. Um, one is, and this is a great question. So Chase asks, what happens if you're at a company and your target market is someone that obviously, you know, you want to experience, you know, develop empathy for, you want to understand them deeply, et cetera, et cetera. But what if they're like so different from you and you can't, you, you're not there yet. You don't fully get them yet. What is the antidote to that. The example he gives, I think there's many different examples of this, but the one example he gives is, for example, let's say you're selling to a very, you know, niche ethnic market, but you are completely, you know, outside of that. Um, It might be hard to empathize uh, about what their issues and struggles and pain points are. 
that's just one example, but I, I can see that for anything, like even included health. I mean, Ching, you guys are servicing a subset of the population that perhaps went through a lot. And if you personally as a marketer or creative haven't gone through that, then how do you develop a service that, that does a good job at that? I'll go back to the research specialist and having that muscle, that arm early on in your organization. Um, it actually might be a the, the right mindset going into it because if the target market that you're designing for, you are making all sorts of assumptions. I don't know, if you're working for Instagram, you're like, I use Instagram and I, um, I can assume that these people want to do X, Y, and Z and you don't make the time, carve out the time to do the deep research and understand, not make these generalizations and understand the segments of the market. That's a risky and dangerous place that you can put yourself. Um, and I feel like there are maybe some industries that that lend itself more uh, easily to those assumptions because they're a consumer, um, a, consu a consumer B, uh, B2C company versus the healthcare industry, where um, it's it's easier to make that uh, to make that um, argument to to the higher ups that we need to carve out the time because we we don't understand these users. But as a baseline, that's that's an exercise that every one of us needs to be doing right from the get go. Right. So the the the, the hope is that with this person or team, they bring those insights to the rest of the team and helps familiarize, you know, and, and of course, empathize eventually with what is trying to be accomplished. Yeah. And I would say if possible, um, join in on one of those calls. You may be busy designing with your headphones on just one or two of those calls. Be a fly on the wall. You're going to learn gold <laughs> and it's going to change your mind. <laughs> And this may be a little controversial, but um, <clears throat> it's the bed of nails approach in my in my opinion, because I feel like people get uh, fearful that they don't understand everyone, including their you know their background, their culture, that audience, and everything. But if you really look at all the great campaigns, the great brand angles, the great everything that you know companies are doing, that's usually based off of a single human insight. And so like, just like in a bed of nails, if you have a million nails, none of them are going to penetrate. But if you have just one, it'll poke through, right? Like that's the analogy I use all the time. Mm -hmm. You really need to go out there and just get a good research, like, like Ching said, that just finds that one human insight, that one individual and when, an insight that's like human behavior, not a piece of data that says, oh, this type of audience prefers this by 17%. No, you want to find out like, they do this action because they feel X. Like what's that human insight? And then base your, your content, your creative, your experience all on that. And that will ring true and that's enough. Like you don't have to boil the ocean. Yeah, yeah. I, I just came across an example yesterday um, just to pull that thread a bit further. Uh, why consumers use, you know, those like meal kit companies. There's like so many of them, but what one company found is that really the core pain and the human insight here is that they just can't think of, like they just don't want to be bothered with like, what the hell am I going to cook tonight? It's not about the grocery shopping. It's not about the ingredients. It's not even about the recipes. You can Google anything. It's literally like, I do not want to think about what I'm cooking tonight. And so the fact that it just shows up at your door and you're just like, okay, this is what I'm cooking tonight. Um, that was a great human insight. So that, that's a great example. Um, yeah, the bed of nails. I'm going to use that analogy. Uh, I think it also talks, um, one thing worth mentioning is also the type of people you hire on your team. Of course, you want a diverse set of people with all kinds of different worldviews. And from what I found on top of that is curious creatives uh, do a, a very good job at research or just opening up to different points of view or taking in those human insights that anybody can relate to, that requires you as a creative to be really curious about the world, whether you're just doom scrolling through Reddit or deep diving on a subject matter. As long as you have that inherent quality of curiosity, I find that at, at least those types of hires, those type of people on your team 
will be open to those different perspectives. So it's worth considering when hiring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great point. Yeah. It all roads lead to like good hiring. Basically that's the answer to everything. <laughs> um, Matt is asking if when you're using an outsourced design team, whatever, right, whatever model it is, maybe it's a freelancer or Bob down the street, maybe it's an agency, maybe it's like a super side type solution, maybe it's a marketplace that you're using, whatever that looks like, how do you make sure that the folks that you're working with that live outside your team have accountability and ownership? Setting up expectations. Um, I actually learned this from our legal teams, um, as, as surprisingly as it might sound, um, they're really experts at setting up expectations and negotiating contracts. So mm -hmm. when I started working with vendors, contractors, companies like Superside, I worked a alongside um, our legal counsel to really identify what is the scope of the project? What is the common language we're using between these two parties? Let's make sure we're talking in the same way and we're setting up the right expectations. So when we start the project, there are no surprises along the way. So I think the advice I can give to whoever asked the question is whether it's an individual you're working with or a company, having those upfront discussions about what you're trying to accomplish, aka brief, and the scope of the project, the timeline, who's going to be on it, how do we want to share work, how do we want to collaborate, all of those things, if you can get both parties to nod their heads and agree upon, you'll find that the process is so much smoother along the way. And nobody is left disappointed because you've communicated. There is no like that gap of like, why didn't they know what was in my head? Why wasn't it communicated? Mm. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. The I think you know, having dealt with legal people myself, <laughs> lawyers, they, they are, you're right, they're incredibly good at like getting you on the same page. Um, but I often find that the way they do that may not be um, super 100%. conducive for the creatives, right? Like it's like, sometimes it's like long documents, sometimes you have to like sign away your first child and all the subsequent <laughs> children. Like there's a, there's a lot of acknowledgements and like leaning in that you yourself have to do. Um, it's, it's harder for, you know, I'm just thinking out loud, sorry, I'm riffing, but yeah, I, I, I feel like it can be harder for certain personalities for sure. And, and I, and I will say like, you're right. I've, I've definitely dealt with people where you're like, this is, this is what I believe. This is how things should operate. And then they'll nod their head and be like, yep, but I don't like this one thing. And they can be very explicit with that. And, and they have clarity of thought around that. Uh, but not everybody can get there. Yeah. And to clarify, I'm not expecting anybody on my creative team to become a lawyer or anything, or even to understand half of the, that discipline. At the end of the day, uh, legal counsel is there to risk manage. Mm. Um, and that's not the point of view of a creative. We are like uh, opportunity seeking. We want to expand our world. But again, this is just a skill that, again, with the curious mindset, we can acquire from different disciplines, from different parts of the organization. We can learn valuable skills. What I learned from those uh, legal counsels is the idea of setting up expectations up front and really communicating clearly what we're trying to accomplish with the project. We should not use legal terms when we're talking to our creative team. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, Sam, did you want to add something to that? I thought you were going to say something. No? Okay, cool. All right. Clint Clinton is asking, as a design manager, I struggle finding the balance between allowing my designers to have creative freedom, but also ensuring that all output meets our standards. How do you um, how do you handle this balance between being too involved and like letting go? And like, I, I again, I can totally see his plight because you know possibly everybody needs something slightly different. Um, but yeah, you don't want to be too hands off, but at the same time, you don't want to be um, in the weeds all the time. What what does that balance look like? I love this question. Um, it's it's kind of going from being an intro manager who knows how to manage work to being that next level really where you really know how to manage people. And what you wanna do here for the person who asked the question is how do you teach your designers to know what good is? Because right now you're in a place where you're not gonna be able to scale your leadership. If you have to look over the work and say, yes, this is good, no, this isn't good. You hire more and more people, that's not going to work anymore. You're going to run out of time. And so the next level now is how do you teach people to know if it's good? 
What guidelines, what frameworks can you give them? Do you give them a checklist of questions they need to ask themselves? You know, does it scale? <laughs> is it accessible? You know, whatever that thing is. Um, but what you want to do is teach your designers, your creatives to be critical thinkers as well and to really be able to judge their own work. And then hopefully the next level after that, you know, is teach them to teach others. And then the whole thing kind of repeats itself. And as you go, you get to grow your impact because more and more folks have become self-sufficient under your coaching. Shahar, you, you had a big team at Pixar. Anything interesting that you, that you can bring to the audience from there? Yeah, I, I, it's a really great point that Samantha is bringing because especially in a creative field, a lot of what we do is subjective to a degree. Of course, we can measure it at the end of the day. We can get data. But as a leader, you're going to sit across a design. You're going to look at a Figma file or a Photoshop file, and you're going to have a reaction. You're going to need to give feedback. Um, and what you think is the right approach might not be the right answer for another design director or a different person who is evaluating creative. So I think it's really important, like Samantha said, to establish what is good work in your opinion, kind of creating that North Star, whether it's through just casual inspiration, like look at the type of work I admire out there in the world, um, whether it's educating them on design principles or creative principles that you care about, um, allowing for those discussions. You know, something I found really useful with our team, because you're right, we had a huge, like almost 30 designers across the world. Um, I found that we, never really spent time talking about design. We reviewed projects. We looked at granular things within the design, but we never had opportunity to step back, look at all our work and discuss what we like about it, what we don't like, yeah. how do we align across teams. Um, so creating those spaces can really allow for design teams to discuss among themselves what they think is right and what is a good approach. That way it's not only like kind of top down, like, here's the right way, like my way or the highway. Um, it really gives you an uh, opportunity to discuss it. And what does creating that space look like? Like, is it structured? Have you experimented with that at all? Yeah, we called it the creative collective. I think by defining it as, um, like even giving it a name that is different than like a creative review already mm. sets different expectations on what are we trying to accomplish with that meeting. Also, as a leader, I need to set that expectation or like kind of establish what the purpose of that meeting is when we begin. How we share the work in those meetings and how we talk about it um, really kind of shapes the discussion. So if we would like display a bunch of websites we designed for PixArt and I went and spoke first and gave feedback first, that kind of created a dynamic for the team, right? They would kind of sit back and just wait for me to give the feedback. They wouldn't want to participate. By me maybe waiting for a junior designer to give their opinion, to discuss it or kind of raise a question, I'm allowing for a more organic conversation. So I think, again, it's, it's a little tricky, I'll admit, in the digital world. I, I miss the world where we could hang everything on the wall and like kind of mark with a red Sharpie and stuff. But I think the way you, you kind of, discuss and establish those spaces online can really help um, have more of those organic conversations. Cool. Thank you for that. Um, Lee is asking, if half of your team are rock stars and always take on any challenge that's given to them, but the other half are maybe a bit more order takers um, and only do what they're asked to do, how do you motivate the one group to become like the other? And actually the framing of his question was sort of almost uh, talking about um, over like achievers and underperformers. I don't know if order takers are always underperformers. I, I don't wanna make that, I think, I think that's an important distinction here, uh, but that, that just so you know what the context of that question was. So there's like a rock star group, just like running with stuff, you know, just taking it in their stride. And one was just like sitting back and he's asking, I, I, and maybe you can actually have some commentary on, is that even, is that a good mix? Do you even want everyone to be a rock star? I mean, if you read, uh, oh, what is that book? I just lost it. Anyhow, there, there's a book, it'll come to me. Um, there, there is conversation about having a good mix of rock stars and then 
all stars or whatever she called it, it was uh, Scott. Um, anyhow, I, I found it's the same problem. And it, it's really hard because you're trying to compare two totally different types of, of groups. You know, one that doesn't necessarily want to be the overachiever and one that is very zealous for it. And I think a mix is good. But what I found is just trying to balance the load so that they're all at least doing their fair share. And it's not like the rock stars are doing like twice as much as everyone else. That's a bigger issue for me because then they'll burn out. But I don't know. I think the, the biggest thing for me that I've found is like just one-on-one -on -one conversations and really digging into what they want, what their goals are, what they're really going after and, and trying to craft a good career for them and hopefully motivate them to do a little bit more. But you're always going to find that. I've, I've never had a team that didn't have that mix. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's necessarily bad to have rock stars and order takers. The way I see it, so we did an interesting research experiment with my team where we developed a skills matrix. We kind of identified crucial skills for a designer or a creative person, and we mapped every designer, what they're strong with, they kind of self-evaluated, um, and where their gaps in knowledge um, are. And we found out kind of something that validated a gut feeling I had that there are two types of creative, generally speaking. There are thinkers and there are makers. Hmm. And it's not that one is better than the other. It's different skill sets that kind of almost complement one another. You have people who want to engage in a conversation, be more strategic, think about high concepts. And there are people who want to plug in, headphones on, just tell me what to do and I'll go ahead and do it. Hmm. Um, I don't think it's necessarily bad to have those two types of creatives as long as you the manager or leader know how to utilize them in the right way. Yeah, that's fair. Ching, any, anything to add there? Have you had that on your team on the UX side? Yeah, I was thinking about um, something that Adam said that go, goes back to human behavior. Like there's research that you do within your own team to, to understand um, mostly through one-on-ones why they are behaving in that way, why they're, they're the superstar and why they're the rock star. And are they, are they comfortable in that position or is the superstar um, going above and beyond because they're worried about a certain thing that somebody may, may uh, the company may may lack, um, and they have to put in the extra hours. So do that do that investigation within your own team, and um, make sure that that those who are going above and beyond or under learn learn what's behind that, um, and do do the listening tour. Yeah, appreciate that. Okay, I'm being told that we're at time. We're actually over time, so we have to wrap this up. I'll end with one question, what is the golden ratio of creatives on a team? So you've got video producers, copywriters, illustrators, what is what is the golden ratio of that? And also, if you can, um, and Shahar, you and I have had this chat before, actually, but also the golden ratio of designers versus marketers, assuming you are all on the same team. Anyone want to take a crack at this tough one? <laughs> I know I, I I know there's my ideal of what I would want, but it's really hard because it's based on each company. Like what if you're in a startup and you need a ton of video because it's really video based content, then you'd need a lot more video producers versus, you know, if you're, uh, you know, you're just creating a lot of email campaigns and it's writers and designers. So it, it depends on the on the business, I think, for the easy answer. But I don't know if there's a gold in, in all those different types of businesses. I think that for me, the biggest I haven't struggled so much with that as like, oh, I need to have like 10, 10 more video people because I, I, you know, there's less of them compared to all the other groups. I've never had that issue. For me, it's always been the marketer versus the creatives. And it's because mm -hmm. one creates work and one does work. And so <laughs> balancing out, you know, if you have too many marketers that are all spinning up requests and need this and that, then you're going to burn out your creative team. So it's just balancing enough people to manage the work as you have people creating the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's totally fair. And yeah, you know, I, I, over the years of being at Superside, like the way that we've found success on our team is that uh, I think to your point, Adam, like the plans that marketing puts together requires extremely good and sometimes fast creative execution. And so what we ended up doing is actually 
um, kind of creating these like smaller work streams. So it's like, hey, these are the two people, even though they're on the creative team, these are the two people that are like very tightly aligned with the performance marketing team. They're in all the meetings, they look at all the data together, et cetera. And similarly for other groups, the content marketing group, the video team, et cetera, et cetera. And that's really helped us a lot. And we, we have found that adding creative capacity just allows us to move a lot faster, um, which is, you know, in retrospect, it's like, duh, of course that's going to happen. But it, it's funny how you have to kind of do it to like realize it. Um, but that, that's that's probably true for Superside given how marketing led we are. Uh, but Shahar, like, yeah, what's what sort of, what have you seen and, and what is your golden ratio if there is one? Yeah, it's interesting uh, how much has changed since the last time we talked about the, the topic because uh, my answer in the past to you was, I need more creatives, like bring them on. And the environment has changed drastically. We've seen it. You mentioned it on LinkedIn. Suddenly we need to be a much more particular or mindful of who we're hiring. What's the cost for headcount? How can we re remain flexible? These numbers, these questions are suddenly popping up more often, especially in startup land. Um, what I found as a useful exercise for me as a creative leader is evaluating what capabilities, and it kind of goes back to what Adam said, what are the capabilities that are constant, things that I'll need in-house, they're always being serviced on a daily basis, and what are those flexible, like the ones that will fluctuate, like I know that I have three big campaigns a year, those are going to fluctuate, I might need some capabilities that come and go. So I think that's where I would start evaluating what are those constant needs, who I need on staff and who I need as contractors or companies like Superside, and then kind of build out the, the team like that. Um, so sadly, there is no golden ratio. I am still a big believer in great, big creative teams, but sometimes a small nimble team that can flex and grow when the project arises could be a, a really good answer, especially in, during these times.